OTB's The Hurling Pod with James Skell and Paul Murphy. People of Galway, we love you. I don't want to leave the people of Waterford down, you know, because they're my life, you know. People of Waterford are my life, you know, and I, 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 I love, I love, I love my county, you know. We love Jamalan. It's almost like they're afraid to kind of mm. go and hurl and yeah. just let themselves express themselves. They're, it's like as if they're nearly afraid to make a mistake and sometimes you have to make a mistake and just throw off that bit of nervousness and have a go. Yeah, it's pure constipated hurling. Welcome along to the YouTube edition of episode 7 of season 2 of The Hurling Pod. About 90 minutes of hurling chat coming up with streams every week at 10pm on Off The Ball's YouTube channel. Uh, we premiere the video then, so check it out each week. Uh, just the plan for this coming week, well you can get the audio podcast a little bit earlier than the video, around about 6pm each Monday throughout the season. Generally we will have a Wednesday bonus episode, not the case this week, we managed to just cram all the chat into one episode this week, but for the last few weeks we have been putting together a bonus pod which is a collection of the answers to the questions uh, that you send into us each week but to get that you need to be a subscriber to the hurling pod feed so that's the best way uh, to get the audio content on the hurling pod if you subscribe to the hurling pod feed you get that brucey bonus of an extra half an hour or 40 minutes of hurling chat each wednesday morning as well so we've got the semi-final lineup complete for this weekend the all-ireland champions limerick will be at home against their Munster rivals Tipperary who finished top of Division 1B and Cork who were top of 1A will also be on the road on Sunday afternoon a 4pm start for their game against Kilkenny Cork did beat the Cats when they met at Porky Cueve last year so they'll be looking to repeat the trick on Kilkenny soil this time around the relegation playoff between Leash and Westmead the teams who finished bottom of 1A and 1B respectively has been set for Semple Stadium at 2pm on Saturday afternoon Westmead having relegated Leash from the championship last year at the same time, the race continues to join Kildare in the Division 2A final as Offaly host Kerry in Tullamore. Kildare got a draw at that venue against Offaly on the weekend just gone past to finish top of the standings in 2A on scoring difference. And the Lily Whites now await the winners of Offaly and Kerry in that final. Also on the pot, we're going to be answering your questions from the week gone by. Paul Murphy and James Skell alongside me for Episode 7 of Season 2 of The Hurling Pod. The reason I don't have an elaborate intro, Paul Murphy, is because there wasn't much hurling on TV on the weekend just gone by. Um, for those of us who were incredibly dedicated, you had to stay up past 11 o'clock last night to catch that final little segment of the Sunday game. I can understand loud supporters were particularly annoyed that there were no cameras there for their big victory against Cork, but hurling fans didn't get much TV love. And even if you wanted to watch the live game, which was a rotter in the end between Kilkenny and Waterford, you had to go onto the TG Car app or the player to watch it. So final round of the hurling... Hurling didn't get a whole lot of love from the broadcasters this weekend, Paul. No, it didn't. Uh, like you said, it was on the graveyard shift there as well with the Sunday game, so it was um, it was tough enough watching. But yeah, there, there wasn't a lot of fireworks really from the last round. Um, maybe some of the matchups were never going to produce that. But even as well, like you said, Watford and McKinney, to be honest, I think if, there, if, if it was a better day, really, it was poor conditions now, Nolan Park for both sides. And it really descended into a lot of slipping and sliding and dropping balls. And particularly the last few minutes of the game, quite a lot of balls passed out to wingers, just went underneath them and things just skidded off the ground. So overall, I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, they're, they're thin enough on the ground, as well, to be honest. <laughs> Blank. <laughs> Blank enough. But uh, yeah, look at uh, one of those weekends. We'll just have to put it down to that. Right, Skell, if, if everyone hasn't switched off by a minute into the podcast now, we're doing okay. Um <laughs> I don't know, look, I mean, obviously it's been talked about the phony war and whatever else during the season, but I really thought that Kilkenny against Waterford was going to be good because I thought there was loads of incentive for both teams uh, to get to the semi-finals for very different reasons. Waterford defending their title. Kilkenny, as Derek Lingham mentioned last week, wanted extra games and a chance to prepare for the Leinster Championship. And then we're served up what was a little bit of a dud encounter. Now, some of that may well be down to the pitch. It took two games in difficult conditions yesterday, but also the tactical setups didn't exactly lend themselves to open and entertaining hurling either. No, there was it was kind of a negative setup, especially from Watford's side. And like the reason there's an allowance and appreciation when you consider conditions, like I suppose nine tenths of the club pitches around the country are closed. So obviously it's tricky to play in conditions like that. Um, but still, you're looking at top level hurlers, and you're trying, you're, you're you're hoping they'll they'll treat it to a bit of a game, especially when for one of the teams, it's the last game before they have they have rolled into championship. So I was expecting a good game. I was expecting a bit of a humdinger, a real physical encounter. I thought Waterford would 
go at Tipperary in a similar style of the, or go at Kilkenny, excuse me, in a similar style of the Tipperary and that didn't materialise. Um, I didn't know what way they were playing, to be honest. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I'm watching it on TV, right? And I'm trying to get a feel for their setup. Not a clue. I hadn't a clue who was where or what was happening. It just it just looked like, here lads, just run around where you want to go there. And, and see what's, and if you get the ball, great. If you don't, so be it. You know, it just, it, at least Kilkenny has a small bit of structure. And I, I'd say even at one stage, it confused the King Lads looking around seeing, you know, Callum Lyons up and for forward line. Do you know what I mean? Tag the Burka, like, uh, up and uh, right, right half forward at one stage. And I'm just thinking, what, like, where is the structure? Like, where is the, the game plan here? So it was a hard game to read. You use the word rotter. I think it's a good word to use in fairness, you know. But look, the Kilkenny be happy. They advanced. They, they sneaked out a victory uh, in, in the finish. And, um, you know, they move on. All right, Paul, try and break down what Waterford are trying to do at the moment. Because from my observations of it, because I didn't get to see the match live yesterday, so I watched it this morning. And then my thought watching the game throughout was Waterford are trying to run the ball continually and are trying to run the ball particularly into the forward line. At the same time, we can talk about Desi Hutchinson in maybe more detail in a few minutes. Their lethal finisher from last year is out the field. Stephen Bennett, as you mentioned last week, is not getting the same type of ball, hasn't scored from play during the league. I'm not sure exactly what the overall plan here is after seeing Waterford play half a dozen matches. Yeah, I'm not sure. And I don't think the Waterford players are even sure, to be honest, at the moment, because um, it, it's very chaotic is the only thing I can look at, or I don't think I can say about it. There's touches of what I would have seen with Wexford a few years ago and Davey was over them, particularly with the puck outs. Um, and I, like something I would, I would kind of like recognise as happening with Waterford is if we were playing Wexford a few years ago, you might score over on the right wing. So you'd work the ball up the right wing, Walter Welch pops it over and suddenly you look over to the left side and there's a bit of a channel open and now you have like Dermot O'Keefe or someone bombing up the right side because this is what the program to do with puck outs. So they relied a lot on puck outs and maybe trying to overload the opposition defence at times like that. So they'd run players up that you weren't expecting to see up there. But, you know, oftentimes with clever teams anyway, we've seen that defeated with Wexford or with Wexford when... You know, the opposition would just let one lad go up and compete with that player who was bombing up the channel. The, the ball breaks, and now Wexford were left with maybe a little bit exposed at the back. Watford, for, for periods there, only for the conditions maybe, and Kilkenny were a bit wasteful at times, they could have left themselves wide open at the back. Um, you know, the fact that the ball was so heavy and it was a rough day, if that was a summer's day and you could snap that ball around, there was huge gaps opening up. So it seemed to be kind of a feast or a famine at times. They were nearly fully back at times. And then at certain times of puckouts, there was two Watford men inside their own 65. So it was just, it was a little bit chaotic from that point of view. Um, and like that, like, you know, as Skettle is saying there, Caleb Lyons, you know, arriving into the full forward line. Now, he's actually been fairly effective during the league, but I think that's more down to his own personal ability that he's been fairly effective. Desi Hutchinson, like if I'm a full back and Desi Hutchinson wanders out past the 45 towards 65, I'm saying brilliant. And one of the first things I'd be thinking is putting myself in the boots of the other team. What don't the other team want? Any team playing Watford doesn't want Desi Hutchinson in on the 14. So whatever game plan you're going to have for me, it involves Desi Hutchinson being on the 14. It involves Ty De Burka controlling the string or pulling the strings at centre back. So um, I know Daly came out after the game and he said a few things. He said they're still working on what they're trying to do. And I just don't buy that, really, to be honest. I just, I think at the moment, Waterford don't know what they're doing. Uh, and considering the team really knew what they were about at this stage last year, they look like a team who don't really know what they're about at all now. And for them or Kilkenny, I would say Watford actually need one or two more games at the moment, more than Kilkenny actually needed. Because, okay, Kilkenny weren't perfect at all uh, over the weekend, but you could see what they were trying to do, and you could see a lot of it came down to ball handling errors and different things. With Watford, I think they were way further off the mark. So I think they potentially are the team that could actually need more games than Kilkenny. Yeah, I mean, Skell, I'm looking at Desi Hutchinson's stats here as provided by Hurler on the Ditch on Twitter yesterday. Possessions, 14. Shots, 0. Hand passes, 8. 5 of them sideways. Stick passes, 3. 1 sideways. Dispossessed, twice. Freeze, 1. 1. Freeze, conceded, 1. Possession location, inside, 45. 0. Between the 45 and 65, 4. Between the two sixty five six 6. And in his own half, 4. They are the stats of a workman-like midfielder, not the stats of a deadly inside forward. They were the, they'd be the stats I'd expect of a Killian Buckley type person who could be bouncing around between midfield and a half forward line. They're not the stats of an all-star forward who who is a lethal finisher and one of your mainstays and one of your main areas of scoring. So 
I don't understand it. It's it's in one of my it's in again I have very few notes as well, Murph. But one of my notes here is is player form slash positions, and you touched on it there a minute ago, Will about Bennett. So they're getting no look no look from him after the minute, but nothing's coming off. Not, he's not being fed into neither. If, like, if you have a Jesse Hutchinson type person in there, there might be an out ball for Jesse to give to Bennett. You know, something could provide be provided between the two of them, and if you throw in Ozzy Gleeson too on top of it, something might materialize. But the way they're situating Desi and situating Ozzy at times, albeit him injured. It just they're not getting the most out of the team so like when you have when you introduce a game plan and it's new and it's let's call it innovative all right and it doesn't quite get off the ground early the team reverts back to individual so what you're doing you're working you're working as, a, as, a, as, a, as an individual as opposed to a unit and that's where loads of things break down and i was disappointed yesterday to see the waterford the strategy that they're operating because even in those conditions when you when you mix the conditions with um the new the game plan as i just said Simplicity is key, like just keep it as simple as you can. Go tight at the back, create space up front, and let's see what happens. You know what I mean? Mm. But like yesterday, it just fell not just between two stools, it fell way down. And like, when you're not, you're not utilizing one of your best players, then I have to seriously call into question the strategy. Like, I'm equating Daisy Hutchinson uh, to, let's say, Connor Whelan now being in the half back line for Galway. That makes categorically no sense because he's one of your lethal finishers, lethal ball winners, your best scoring forward, and you haven't taken. 10 possessions out of his 14 inside his own half like that's not logical at all mm. you know if it's like if it doesn't sound right it usually isn't right <laughs> you know so like with Desi in his own half back line something has to give there yeah I would think as well Murph the two meaningful games in the league for Waterford were the games against Tipperary and against Kilkenny so therefore if you're going to go with Desi Hutchinson for the championship in his regular role you surely play him there against both Kilkenny and Tipperary. You don't experiment in those two matches. Like, if you want to look at Desi Hudson further out the field, yeah, you do point. it against Leash, you do it against Dublin. You don't do it now. No, no. And and like you said, it's it's probably an indication of the way they're going to go for championship. I don't think they're going to abandon this now come the round-robin phase. But I don't see where it's going to work from. And it's it's exactly what Skehill is saying there. I don't see where the return is going to come from Desi Hutchinson playing out there. You know, you're asking a lot of him. I don't like I remember a good few years ago the example I'd give was um when Cork played player in the 2013 final, Patrick Horgan in the first half was quite blocked out. You know, they were surrounding him because Claire knew that to keep Patrick Horgan out of the game. So Cork brought out Patrick Horgan out around the half forward line to get him out into a bit of space and pop balls over. You understand when that happens. But when Desi Hutchinson is picking balls up in his own midfield, well, who's he going to hit him into? Because he's the dangerous person. Like, but who's he sending these balls into? So uh, it's 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 kind of a rock and a hard place now for Waterford because if you abandon it now, you're entering into a round robin phase, abandoning what you've been trying to implement for the last five games. Whereas it, it, it appears the right thing to do. I'd abandon it now and go and get Desi Hutchinson back in. But there's an element of kind of you know showing a lack of confidence in, in the game plan you're trying to implement now also. So it's it, I, I think Watford kind of put themselves in an awkward position here. But they have to. I think they have to abandon it. Get get him back in around the goal. Even if you are only playing two lads inside and you still do want to bring someone out. Like Watford under Derek McGrath a good few years ago used to do it in that, I don't know, the Dunford used to start in corner forward and he was the lad that used to drop out in order to allow Tyke to Burke to sit back or maybe it was Jamie Barron but they used to start someone in there and move them out. But don't let that be Desi Hutchinson. So... As Cahill said there, the stats don't make sense. They don't add up. And it'd be like, to give the Kilkenny equivalent, it's like TJ moving back to centre-back. Let's put him back hit there. Great, he may get on 20 balls, but sure, what good is it? You know, what yeah. good is it if he's if he's back there? And do you think do you think as well, Murph, um, if they abandon the game plan out at the moment, that like confidence will be lost in the management? Because you're trusting the management to <clears> instill <throat> a game plan to the, to the benefit of the team you have at hand. So if they go abandon it, is it saying like, right, these players aren't capable or the management aren't capable? Well, I would just say if, if I was them and I was abandoning it, you have a team meeting and you say, listen, lads, we tried a few things during the league. It didn't necessarily work out. We know where our strengths lie. We know where our weaknesses are. But, you know, we're going to go back to the basics here to a certain element and go with what we know in that Desi Hutchinson. And you've explained yourself now. But I think all the players know this. Like, they know that what the few sh- things that should be happening, such as Desi being in there. So... If you do do go and do it, I think a lot of players go, okay, I understand this now. Because another thing, which I think for Stephen Bennett and Desi Hutchinson, that's important as well, is a lot of players, and I would have certainly been one of them, is 
I, I would have always been able to get more involved in a game when I understand what's happening around me. Let's say two or three plays before the ball gets to me. Like I can see players moving. But I don't think the Waterford players at the moment can see that because it's so chaotic. Nobody really knows what's happening ball to ball. But again, go back to Limerick. If you look at Limerick and look at the person that has the ball and then look at the players near him, they all start moving because they understand what's about to happen. But Watford aren't doing that. Now, I could see, I'd yeah. even say I could see Kilkenny were moving, like a lot of get the ball and be a runner off the shoulder and you could see lads moving, but the ball handling let them down. So that's where I think Watford now need to kind of, whatever game plan you're going to go with, there has to be serious shape on it where at least players can know a ball or two in advance when to start moving or where the ball is going to go or what players are going to do. Because at the moment, it's very lateral. There's not much penetration happening inside and back lines. And I think for the likes of Desi and Stephen Bennett and these lads to get on the ball, they need to be able to use their brain and read what the lads around them are doing, which I think it's very hard to do at the moment. Yeah. Mm. Scal, the comments which came from Davy Fitz after the game. So he spoke about Hutchinson and said that he's empowering him and it's he wants to come out and be more involved again I'm not sure whether that's actually instruction I can't imagine that Desi Hutchinson would have turned around and said you know what I'd actually like to play a bit further out the field I okay, that there's a lot in Davy's comments now so um like I know you can use the word empower but I get the feeling he's kind of half thrown Desi under the bus there I, I have this feeling that, that it's kind of semi-instruction or full instruction from Fitzy that he wants Desi to play in these kind of roles and positions uh, to try and make a different put a different stamp on the team if you know what I mean why though Scott? like this thing I don't understand right so the three of us have all pretty much universally agreed and I see the frustration of Waterford fans too like what is there about Desi Hutchinson that makes more sense having him out in the middle of the field rather than being closer to goal well it makes no sense do you know what I mean it makes absolutely no sense like let's, let's get that quite clear the three of us again we're, we're aligned in our thinking here that Desi's best position is putting him in corner forward or somewhere in the forward line you know, the furthest he should travel, Desi, is beyond his own 45. No further. Like, he shouldn't go any further than that. Or the opposition 45, excuse me. But, like, I, I can't draw a rhyme or reason to it. See, normally when someone on a team does something or does a different type of setup or put-off strategy, I can see logic in it some way. I can see what they're trying to do and maybe they're just not getting that, you know, the rub of the green just yet and maybe they haven't just mastered it. So I can see it, what they're at. But I can't see what they're doing, Desi. I can see, because when Desi gets the ball, there's no pattern after him. So like, if he was doing something specific or repetitive when he gets the ball, that there was creating a, at least a chance or creating some danger, then I can see the I can see the reasoning behind it. But I can't see anything. Like you said yourself there, he hit eight lateral passes. Do you know what I mean? Out of his 14 possessions, something, something like that. That's not him being effective. You know, like, I, I just don't, I don't see the reason for it. Like, and, you know, Fitz's comments, he mentioned Desi, all right, yeah, but then he also mentioned the team as a whole, which I thought was, in fairness, highly disrespectful to both the players and the management prior. You know, I, I think it's just Davy, if I'm honest, creating an excuse already for a championship exit. Which can't get me wrong, it's a, it's a serious thing to say when you're when you're let's say a month away from championship. But like we've seen this time and time again with Davy's teams. If he doesn't he he, he looks his his term with a team is maximum three years. Because he comes in, gets a short term kick, he's no more plans, gone. Do you know what I mean? Brian Cody had long plans, let's say, over his period you know, and me had no doubt if he was left there he'd have long plans as well. But David doesn't have long plans. He's short-term plans to get a kick. And if it doesn't work out, he'll bolt. You know, everything he says in the media, and I don't think people, like he's said an awful lot of shite over the last number of years. You know what I mean? Even last year when he finished with um, with Wexford, he was drained. He was this and this and that. And next thing you know, he's looking for the Galway job and looking for the Waterford job, looking for the car. He's setting himself up now for a bit of, to save himself. You know what I mean? Because he's probably looking at the team at the minute and going, geez, I haven't got these lads humming. They're not in the right place at the moment. I'm going up against Limerick and Clare, etc. I'm going to get walloped, <laughs> knocked out of the championship and potentially finish fifth. You know, and then that looked very, very bad in his resume. You know, which has been questionable over the last number of years, to be honest. So right. I think... Sorry. No, I was going to say, just, just, <laughs> I'm rolling. <laughs> just to, to give his comments, and you can roll away after that, I'll, I'll let you yeah. straight back in, is that he said that he took them over when they were in a very bad place psychologically at the end of last season after their disappointment in Munster. Uh, he felt like it was very much the start of a journey. And he was saying that, you know, effectively, they're massive underdogs to come out of Munster. No one's really expecting them to come out over the next couple of months. So in a way, he's played down everything and played down even the fact that this is a team who were league champions last year. Yeah, and I agree with you. Like, and th this is a team that have won a major competition last year and that were in super form up to a point. And something something happened, right? You know, like they didn't all fall off a cliff for, for 10 reasons. There's one or two reasons why the team probably didn't perform. And like every team, when you we're always on about the margins in intercounty hurling. When you get to championship and a couple, couple of teams come up three or four percent and you go down three or four percent, the margin looks huge then on the day of the game. You know, whereas in this instance, I, I just I honestly genuinely believe 
that if the team were in such a terrible place and mentally, psychologically, physically, go back to basics then. Get them started, strip it all back, build the foundations to go again, rather than introduce this shite he's at with lads running all over the place. And I've seen it with Wexford. You know, we saw it with Wexford. I mentioned before, we played them in 20, 2020 Leinster semi-final in Crow Park and it was the same kind of system. Lads bombing forward, puck out comes long and all it is is hope. There's no structure to whatsoever. They hope a ball breaks because they all keep narrow. Hope a ball breaks wide and they'll shoot on goal. You know, and Murph mentioned about the, the deep running wing backs. Yeah, we just put Cahal Manning and Conor Cooney on the, the, the two wing backs, get there before them, and then we've them screwed in the counter attack because we've someone like Conor Whelan up there or, or, Joe, or Joe Kenning. Do you know what I mean? So, like, his, his overall systems and game plans, like, they're not that hectic, lads. Like, they're not. Like, they're, they're, I, we're not talking about revolutionary stuff for them. Like, he's, 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 he's instilled the same type of game plan over and over again in every team he's been with. And, like, to be honest, it's not that successful. <laughs> like, and I, I know people say he's won the Ireland yeah but a major asterisk there is Paul Canuck he was with him and I have a very good accord from a number of Clare players that he was the main man that introduced everything and look signs are showing with Limerick what they've done now so I'm not trying to discount what he's done before well I am to a, to a degree don't get no, me wrong you, you, you definitely are like, I mean, <laughs> yeah, David, I just think, David look, Fitzgerald's response to you Scal right now would be that he's won a provincial championship with Wexford he was successful with Waterford in his first run wins an All-Ireland title with Clare very successful you played under him at third level when he was successful yeah, at third level and he was, there's, 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 there's a common denominator here <laughs> so at third level we would have bet everyone our team was, was stacked right we would have bet everyone if, if listen to me if Santa Claus is over the team right we'd have wiped everyone <laughs> Because we've done it ourselves. When he comes to Watford, he's inherited a super team. And look what happened in the final. Okay. Then he comes to Clare as Paul Knurk with him, and he has a good team. And when the Clare players say themselves that Knurk was the main man and was the brains behind it all, you know, I'm listening to them straight up. Then he comes to Wexford, fine, gets a kick out of them, wins the provincial championship. They lost the semi-final ship really when they should have won it when they're a man up. You know what I mean? Then, then he goes to then he like that dies a death. You know what I mean? Like I said to one of the players, I won't name him now because it's not fair. Uh, during a championship game how are you getting on with, with, with Davey and he would just shook his head going oh, and he didn't even say a word he just tottered you know like a child you know give them sweets you know just oh, like, <laughs> do you know what I mean like as in he was just terrible hard work so I can see this ending you know bad for Watford now listen to me if they go along and the players put themselves together and they do something great fair play to them because I think it'll be, it'll be them and them only Right, so, so if that Wexford player was tutting when you asked him on the pitch and you're yeah. obviously you know, having a bit of a chat with, I'm, I'm guessing a Wexford forward. Yeah. Um, therefore, why did the Wexford players get into a car and go down and talk to Davy Fitz to convince him to stay for another season after? Well, I, I spoke about this before, like, and like I, I, I said it before about uh, Clare. And again, I have it on very good authority from players who were in the Clare dressing room at the time that three or four of the most influential players will carry the most weight in the team. And I've seen it myself. Like, if you've got three or four guys who carry weight, a vast majority of the younger people, especially, will follow them, even if it's right or wrong. You know, and that's just the nature of business. It's the nature of, you know, any kind of group environment. So, like, I can be pretty sure that Wexford went down with three of the four most influential players who got anywhere with JV and then asked them to stay, you know. So, like, I I hear that. And, look, Doug, you can, you can read into it from your perspective, saying that it's a positive on his behalf. And I can look at it from my perspective, where I've got actual, you know, from players who said they didn't want to bring him back but ultimately they were overruled by more more senior players and more impactful players with a better relationship with David Paul Murphy to bring you in on this um, have you ever had it where a manager plays you down like that in the media and what did you think because I, I don't know what Waterford fans would have thought or Waterford players would, say, would have thought and even if they care if they wake up this morning and they read the headlines about you know he's only been four months in the job and we're big underdogs for Munster and playing down what's happened after a very middling league campaign I don't think Cody ever played Kilkenny down while you were playing for him, did you? Oh, I would have always found Brian's um, Brian's comments fairly just grounded, really, to be honest. You know, and <clears throat> Brian would have never, <clears throat> he would have never gave a lot of weight during an interview, really. And you know that better than anyone will, probably. That, you know, things went well of a day. So, yeah, we, things went well, but we have a few things to work on. We're happy with this and so on. But he never as drastically went out, even after, let's say, players would have retired over the years and said, you know, we're savage underdogs or anything. He would have always said like that, Never. you know, any day we're going out, we believe we can win or we can, we believe we can win in Ireland. Whether that's true or not, we don't know, but we're going as hard as we possibly can and I full belief in the players I have. And, you know, as a player hearing that, I was always going absolutely brilliant. You know, I can get on board with that and that's what I want to hear. But I'd agree with Skettle in that saying, 
you know, if you ask me with Walford to start of the year, which we probably did, I'd say if you revisit episode one, where, where Walford, I would say, look, they have to revisit psychologically where they are. But other than that, they have hurlers of the year in their uh, team. They have lads who've played in all Ireland finals. They have lads who've won like uh, leagues. They have lads who've do, have done really well. Um, and have, they have all the hurling and probably one of the strongest panels in terms of individual hurlers uh, across the board. They have a savage panel of players. Mm. But why would you go and say that they're massive underdogs? Like, yeah, they're not favourites, but just because you're not favourites doesn't mean you're savage underdogs either. Like, everyone in Munster, except Limerick, are all fighting, and Cork are going really well. After that, you know, anything can happen, and Clare showed it last year. We weren't talking about Clare. Clare were D15 in Munster last year. Clare came out and hurled because they, Brian Lone instilled a bit of belief. They absolutely maximised everything they had to their abilities, and were, you know, just came up short in the Munster final. Mm-hmm. But I'd agree with Skell. I, I think you're prepping yourself here that, I mean, you're downplaying everything. I, I don't even know downplaying. I think you're underselling yourself here so much that everything looks like an improvement then if it comes around to it. Like, so if you overturn Cork, you know, you'll have a little bit of a Indian summer where you'll be like, you know, you'll have two or three days of you be saying, you know, this is absolutely brilliant and these players believe me and so on. And it's these bursts of highs and lows. And I just... I don't think there's consistency can be built on that. And if I was a player waking up this morning, Walter, I'd be just going, okay, Kilken- or, yeah, Kilkenny better than Nolan Park. We didn't perform too well. We have things we can work on. Um, but now we have a bit of time to prepare. But if I heard that, I'm saying, are we? Are we massive underdogs? Do, do, are, are we, is it a two-year plan? So this year, is it written off? Because that was another thing, that it was a, a two-year plan. Um, I just, I, I thought a lot of the stuff was... I, I didn't make sense to me. And it was very far off the opinion I would have given of Watford. If you ask me about Watford, I think they're definitely a team capable of having a good run this year if if they get things right. But Davy seems to have a different idea. Davy's kind of a little bit right enough the year. And if they do get something great, but there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of maybe it's happening in the dressing room, but it, coming out and saying something like that, I I would be very disappointed as a player if I heard it. You can't flick a switch either. No, you can go back in the restroom and say that I've I've this grand plan with the media. We we create a siege mentality, but you can't flick a switch. Yeah, especially in on, on in in a, in a, <clears throat> a sport as fickle on the day as hurling. It's yeah, not there. Like you need to have a, a plan and be implementing that plan incrementally at the start of the year. So mm. four months, he should have four months into his plan, and his plan should be maybe at at fifty percent capacity at the moment. Yeah, but it's at it's at you know it's at zero. Yeah, yeah and it's, I was very encouraged by the performance against Tipperary. I think they, yeah. they've done really well. You know, but they, they, again, I was expecting a backup performance from 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 them, but it just didn't materialize. Yeah, I thought the comment as well about uh, what did he say? I can't I can't change Watford Hurlan in in four months, but not change in itself. But that was a strong statement. I don't, Watford Hurlan doesn't need change. Like yeah. it is not far off where it needs to be. It needs a few tweaks. But the idea that you're you're not overhauling the county here, you're not overhauling structures. You're coming in. And you're hoping to try and just bring it to the next level. If you get, if you asked Watford fans, you know, where would they like to see themselves? I think they would say a good starting point is this time last year, where they were. You know, okay, they hadn't won the league yeah. at this stage, but they were really going well. That's and that's not twelve months ago. You know, so the idea that you mentioned the word change, what are you trying to change here? You're not reinventing the wheel. You you have. I wouldn't even say this the, the spine of a great team. You have a, you have the potential to have a great team there. So change doesn't come into it for me. It comes into putting your spin on it and that being a positive spin and putting good structures in place and mm-hmm. let the players do the work. And I've no doubt, he also said that, look, the players are hurling for me. I've no doubt they are. But the players want to achieve something. So they're there saying, you tell us what to do and we'll do it. So I've no doubt that that is happening. But are, do they have the map to success? I don't know at the moment. Yeah, not to break up the conversation here, but just uh, mid-pod, the fixtures have been confirmed for this weekend. So Limerick against Tipperary is going to be the evening game on Saturday at the Gaelic Grounds. TG Carr is showing this one at half past seven. Semple Stadium in Thurless is going to be the venue for the relegation playoff between Westmead and Leash, which is available on the TG Carr YouTube. That's a two o'clock throw in. And the hurling is also live on this Sunday. Kilkenny against Cork will be at Nolan Park Four o'clock start for Kilkenny against Cork, and that's also going to be on TG Carr. The Division 2A hurling semi final between Offaly and Kerry will be in Tullamore at 2 pm on Saturday. So, they're the fixtures for this question. Weekend. If you will, why, yeah. if I'm reading this correctly, both teams who finished below their opposition are at home. Am I right in saying that? 
Limerick were second, weren't they? Limerick were second, yeah. And, and the playing Chip, who were first. And Cork, who were top, were playing Kilkenny, who were away. So I think it's based on, from the from memory in this one, it's based on the amount of home and away games that you had in the regular section of the league. And I think in the case of Kilkenny and Cork, there was an agreement around home venues there. So I think they agreed that. So I think that's probably the reason why. I'm not sure if that was the case between Limerick and Tip as well. But if there's not a home and away agreement, which is already there, you go for whoever had the most amount of home games and a coin toss if required after that. But what I find really weird about this is that there's no consistency about it. So the relegation playoff between Westmead and Leash is at a neutral venue. The other games are based on home and away agreements. Surely the semi final should be at neutral venues anyway. I, I, I would agree with that, yeah. I, I would have thought personally you could bring uh, the likes of uh, Kilkenny. Where would you bring them? In Cork. Yeah, that one in Thurles. Where, where could they go? Yeah, they could go to Thurles, couldn't it? Yeah. yeah. And is Limerick and Tip a bit mad to go to Cork? Is that a bit mad? Probably probably not ideal, but I'm sure a day out in Porky Cueve wouldn't be too bad for either team. I, I just think you can do one of two things. I know we, we have a question that definitely came in about this, about if you top your group, whether it be one A or one B, maybe you should be assured of home advantage. Maybe that should be the incentive for finishing yeah. top. But... um. It always seems a little bit weird that one team would have home advantage in the semi-finals anyway to me. I, I just think they should both be neutral. I don't yeah. know what you think, Murph. Yeah. Um, I Just consistency, like I said, is probably the best best policy. Like, I'm happy to see the Kenny and Cork outside Nolan Park, and if both teams are happy to do that, happy days. Um, there's also maybe the opportunity as well that you could have paired up uh, one of the other games with uh, one of the league semi-finals. You know, as in, like, so you have your awfully Kerry and like nothing to say you couldn't pair that up with Kilkenny and Cork and Thurles for example just as a bit of a the only reason they can't pair that is because in Division 2A Mm. they had it already set that there was an incentive for finishing second Ah. will be home advantage in the semi-final but that's what I mean like there's no consistency between the leagues whatsoever even down to relegation and promotion it's it's bonkers like if anyone was to draw this up from the start there's no way that if like say if an outsider came in and looked at this they'd go <laughs> well how come you've got two groups at the top and how come these are the rules and you have semi-finals but yet in division two the groups are broken up and it's one up one down and you've got a semi-final and a final why is it not the same structure or not yeah yeah that's it and like even the likes of when you look to I'm sure Kildare will just take her hand off just to go up now um, you know with, with the final and stuff as well it's a bit of a you, you, you'd, you'd imagine just coming top of the group that's that's your final that's it done in their which case is, which is what happened in the Covid year so the Covid year was the <laughs> Division 2A where awfully won it there was no final and they went directly up and then the year after they introduced a final and a semi-final and now we've got the same structure this year I, I don't know it just seems weird that they change it so often as well mm. But that's, that's, it's lads like us making suggestions is the problem well maybe like there's probably <laughs> going to be more radical suggestions that we talk about further on but like I, I just think it's really weird while in the football at least you've got a two up two down system across the board yeah. and you've got finals for the top two teams across they go to play for a piece of silverware but ultimately finishing the top two gets you into the top, the next division for the season afterwards and the system's nice and simple while in hurling obviously this comes from the fact that it's a it's a system that's designed from the top down as opposed to from the bottom up. So it's almost, I think anyway, that it's, it's created in such a way that the element of danger around relegation is removed for the best part within Division 1. So it's very, very difficult for one of the established counties to get relegated and then to hell with the system further down. We'll actually create a totally different system for 2A, 2B, 3A and 3B. But that's one for them to, talk, to think about the crux of it is that we've got two semi-finals this weekend Murph tell us about Kilkenny how did they play against Waterford in your eyes because I think they'll have to up the performance from that game at Nolan Park if they're to beat Cork this coming weekend yeah there was shades of the performance against Tipperary um, with this Kilkenny performance in that um, you know working the ball out of the back line there was quite a few flat passes now I think again the day fed into it that instead of you know, trying to play through the lines and run the ball through players where they might get, you know, caught up and get closed down. They try to play around uh, Watford. There's also quite a good few instances of players coming back, co- coming out of the defence. They get to the half back line and then basically steadying up and looking to deliver this long ball into the full forward line. Again, not a bad ball to deliver if the players are coming out and looking for the ball, but. It was maybe, again, <clears throat> there there was kind of nearly shades of the Wexford match last year where there was maybe one too many long balls going in. Now, I know Kilkenny fans would have been looking on yesterday 
um, your, your, I suppose, neutral Kenny fan, if you want to put it, like where they would have just seen a lot of balls being miscontrolled and would have got quite frustrated at times where Kenny were working the ball out. But again, it was tough for both sides yesterday. It wasn't glamorous. Now, Skell's right. Like, you I mean, you're still playing inter-county. The touches should be a bit, bit better. But look, Kenny will look to up it. Um, it was, it, they, they won't take a huge amount from it. A few things they can take from it, like Billy Drennan's free-taking was immense for, for a really bad day. And think particularly, I think there was two or three frees. One was on, on the halfway line, just underneath uh, the, the old stand, or the new stand, and over the bar, like under them conditions, it was immense. And then he popped over, I think, two more from out nearly in his own half, which was really good stuff. Uh, when they needed to get the score, and then Alan Murphy came on and got a score that just pushed it out. And like even times when they were playing quite bad, I know Watford went ahead by three points at one stage, but in the first half, I looked at the scoreboard and Kikini were up by three points and they weren't really playing well. And sometimes that's an indication that, you know, even though you look like you're not playing well, you're still doing enough to keep your nose in front and you're doing what's necessary. But... Look, a lot of um, there's a lot of players to come back for Kilkenny. There was a, a, a good few changes from the last day with a few injuries, like Richie Reid and Killian Buckley, Paddy Mullen out as well. Um, but nevertheless, good few lads got chances as well. So look, Kilkenny will look to improve definitely. Like it won't be good enough to be Cork the way they performed at the weekend. But there's nothing there so drastic that Kilkenny will be going. This is a mountain first time against Cork. I think given better conditions and as well, Kilkenny will look at this now with Cork coming up. Cork will be favourites for this match. Um, I don't think we'll see. Well, no, easy there, easy there, Davey. Go on. <laughs> no, no, they will be. But like, I mean, if Cork performed like they performed against Wexford, I think Kenny will beat them well. But I think Cork's head will be tuned. They'll obviously put out a very strong team. I'd imagine Cork will go for this because they want to keep the momentum going. Um, but I think Kenny will will relish that. They'll really enjoy now another really good match. There's lots of players there biting uh, biting at the bit now to actually get in. Um, and few players have got opportunities, but very hard to pick a Kilkenny 15 at the moment. So I think with each game, Kilkenny have that desire to actually go and really perform. But there, there, there's there's lots of things to work on from from the Watford game that they'll want to forget about really. But uh, spread the scores as well. Like Owen Cody got two points from play. Uh, after that, it was one point from play from a wide spread of players as well. So um, maybe the day dictated that. Um, Watford weren't a whole lot better either that way. Uh, but look, there's good points to take from and bad points but it wasn't a, a big day of learning for Kilkenny can mm. I ask a random question go on Murph what's your 8 to 15 for, the, for Kilkenny in Championship for fuck's sake 8 to 15 <laughs> that's Sorry. tremendously random instead of asking the whole team tremendously you know, no, no, I just want to know from midfield up no I've been because I've been thinking about this the last couple of weeks okay so because I, I have a <clears throat> I have a liking towards John Donnelly I'm just wondering is he going to be in there <laughs> see this is the thing it's, it's the balance of getting John Donnelly is an enormous workhorse like and he will work anywhere you want to go you need him to go he goes and he breaks up ball um, 8 to 15 what I would be saying for championship uh, I'd be saying Conor Fogarty and or either Paddy Mullen or uh, Paddy Deegan I think Paddy Deegan could be midfield yeah the reason I'm saying it is because I, I think maybe Paddy Deegan might slot back in there I don't see Paddy Deegan staying a left half forward for, for championship the he's only gone, reason he's is, gone over the half back line now he's, he's never come back to the game is he I think Kilkenny have so many options at the half back line but Paddy Deegan's a immense athlete I think what they'll do is Conor Fogarty completely disrupts play at the middle of the field and it's like it's something that people completely underestimate he breaks up as play is coming through the middle he holds up players he gets a flick he gets a block and out of those rooks you know TJ might come out or own Cody might come out but the rook doesn't happen they, that doesn't happen unless the likes of Conor Fogarty is there breaking up the play and to compliment him the likes of Paddy Deegan who can hurl anywhere on the pitch really and is one of the fittest lads I've ever played with I think he could compliment him really well I think Paddy Mullen might just need another year at this level maybe to great hurler absolutely brilliant but there's a little bit less space he has now than yeah. he would with Ballahill okay. so I'd say potentially at the moment you might be looking at that Keen Kenny could drift in there he might just have the power and the strength at the moment to actually go and mix it up with the likes of William O'Donoghue or these lads if that's the plan so we're going forward to Deegan I'll go forward to Deegan for the moment yeah I'm, I'm definitely going to leave out lads here now and they'll give out to me during the week but anyway um, sure half hour line Jesus Christ how do you pick this I mean you're so probably going to talk Adrian Mullen at 10 I presume Adrian Mullen 10 TJ TJ at 11 Yvonne Cordy at 15 I'm quoting 15, yeah. You're actually doing this the right way because uh, the, the knowns, Billy Drennan... Yeah, you're helping him out here, yeah. Billy yeah. Drennan's going to have to be corner forward as well. This is what I want to get to know. Yeah. This is squeaky bum time now. I want to see easy going putting him in. Uh, I have to. He's you're playing. Him in. Yeah, yeah, you have to have him in there, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, after that, then I think I think Walter Welch will will start left half forward. I think come come championship, I think he will because again, it's getting that balance of very powerful player, very capable of winning big ball. Let's say coming down that channel there, and you have players around him like your Billy Drennan's own Cody's who kind of ghost onto ball then around as well like you know you're not playing one dimensionally with all big players with all players of different um, but see John Donnelly so I'd say number 12 there now between John Donnelly and and um, and Walter Welch jeez I don't think I'm leaving anyone out here now hopefully well, not to a neutral to a neutral now maybe I'm go on off here but I, I can't see how John Donnelly's not on your team <clears throat> I know I, see it. I know but often like when you're in the good position like, of, we don't just have Limerick in, in, in 19 Immense. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. But this is the thing. It depends on what you need on a given day. Like if you were going out, like John Donnelly is a workhorse. Are you going to put two workhorses at midfield? Do you need a third one then at half forward? Like Walter Welch in terms of score and Walter Welch and John Donnelly will contribute probably equal amounts in a game. You know, when they're going at two and three points a game. After that, then if you're putting John Donnelly, see if I was putting John Donnelly on, it'd be shutting down a half forward on the other side. Because John Donnelly runs down that line and a lad who's not expecting to be tackled on the opposition half forward like gets tackled by John Donnelly that's what happens but what I would say Eskel is that it's a great place to be that you're actually it's not just a case you have six dead set forwards that you have lads who are going fuck I'm disappointed I'm not in today yeah. right I'll get over it or I'll come on in a game like isn't it let's say if you play John Donnelly wing forward and you're bringing on Walter Welch like Jesus you're bringing on a lad six foot five six foot six 100 kg yeah who's going to go storming at a full back line and he's angry now because he hasn't started so it's going to be a toss up between those two I think for okay. for wing forward there so then you're talking forward so Billy Drennan of Owen Cody Jesus I hope I'm not leaving anyone out here now well your forwards last year you had Billy Ryan and Martin Kogan in the final didn't you? yeah you did see and you had uh, Porrick Walsh am I wrong right Porrick he heard the around the half forward line most of the year didn't he yeah, yeah. he, he he's did he's back Back the way now. Yeah. He's gone back, and I think I think the way Derek sees him at the moment is kind of a, a back come surging out with the ball coming out because he made a few even good runs yesterday. No, no, it wasn't much to 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 point it, but Park is very capable of winning those balls, driving up and creating an attack. I I um, still think Murph, that's his best place to be. By the way, I think he's better mm, with ground to run into rather than yeah. in an auxiliary forward last year. Clever, yeah, and, and like you don't need him there. You don't need him in the forwards when you're debating. Like I, I'm going to eventually leave some forwards on the bench here, like that are going to be very disappointed. Again, with full forward, like Billy Billy Ryan is electric, great pace. Mossy Kion has huge strength, and you saw Mossy Kion last year when he hanged around goal, chipped in with a nice few goals in the, in the round robin. And if you have a lad hanging in there, that okay, he might have maybe ten possessions in the game, but he'll get two goals. Kind of a Conor Whelan type of player, very yeah. physical, do, physically dominant, and balls will break off him, but he's an opportunist and he'll get a goal. Well, there's another dynamic you have going there. So I'd probably say at the moment, Mossy will probably start at full forward again. Okay, let's go. Have I left anyone out there now, Scal? I don't think else? you have, to be honest. No. I don't think you have. But then you're there. Like, I mean, I don't see Keane Kenny staying a right half back. Um, but where are you going to put him after that? That's a good no. lineup, Liz. It's good, yeah. That's yeah. a good lineup, Varys. <laughs> and like. Yeah. Do you know, and where I think the beauty of that is, and like the likes of Galway as well, they'll have it in their own way where you're going, a team might be expecting to see Mossy Keown at full forward, but they actually, geez, Walter Welch is starting there, or Billy Ryan is starting, geez, they weren't, these lads weren't starting the last day. There's competition. And, you know, it goes back to the old cliche of competition for places. Lads are pushing hard, but I think Billy Drennan has done more than enough to be starting in this team. Yeah. But you see, my concern with Kikini is, like, he put up 226 in Slimmick last year, but you can see the 131. Mm. Is your back even strong enough? You know, I don't yeah. hold off. You can pick the. Sorry, guys, the, I went way off. Sorry, sorry, I went way off pick, script there. You can pick the one to seven a different day. We've yeah. just done eight to fifteen. So yeah. sorry, I just wanted to know was Murphy putting in Don Billy, 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 Billy Drennan? That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> and why didn't you ask that question? So are you playing? Well, I, wanted, I wanted you. To, sorry, I have a strange way of doing things. Okay, sometimes. <laughs> so instead of just asking the question, you're a very direct man when you want to be, Sky. Yeah. Instead of no. you asked two questions away from it, and I had to build into it. Right, Grant. <laughs> Sorry, I kind of like that you have to agonise over the other players when clearly I knew exactly what he was angling towards. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like I was debating yeah. over like, oh, Adrian Mullen, yeah, okay, I'll put him here, and yeah, and all I want to know is John Donnelly and Billy Drennan. For God's sake! Right. 
<laughs> elsewhere in Division 1B at the weekend. These games had no stakes because of the fact that Antrim had beaten Leash last week. But uh, Tipperary, uh, one point short of their average of the scores they've been doing this year. So generally it's 33 scores they've been getting. But when you score four goals, you bring that average way over the 33 points, if you want to look at it that way. 428 scored against Antrim. Um, again, very, very impressive. Loads of different scorers on the team. 11 different scorers on the day for Tipperary. Yeah. Uh, they won 428 to 216. Garota Connor looks really good in the freeze again. Nine points, seven come from freeze, 165. I don't know if Ford is going to be hitting the dead balls when Championship comes round, but it seems if Garrod O'Connor is going to start at 11, he's probably going to be the free taker. Uh, John McGrath putting over seven points, uh, six of them coming from play, and then there are goals from Sean Ryan, Porra Campion, Connor Bow. Understand to be Tipperary changed the team around a bit, so did Antrim as well. And um, Tipperary look like they've got loads of firepower scale going into the semi-final against Limerick this coming weekend. This is a, a Tipperary machine that's motoring along very nicely, albeit early on in the year, really. Yeah, and I think, as I sit right now, I, I would have to give them the team the league, obviously, considering where they came from <clears throat> last year's championship to where they are now. And it's not just a, a specific 15 or 17 players that they're using. It looks to be like a 22, 23 players. So, Dean Cahill, as he did with Waterford in the past, looks to have built a group not just a uh, you know a set fifteen, but build a group who can interchange you know into the, into a into a set game plan. So it's like the team is or the group is synchronized. So that if 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 kind of ball comes in, he slaps a goal again, like he did the week previous. So they're the team of the league. They have a huge challenge um, coming up next week. And in fairness to John Kiley, the interview he gave after the match the last day, he was quite bullish about the league, saying that they're in it to win it. Um, it's the best preparation, obviously. So it'll be it'll be a big shootout. It'll be extremely physical because you'd expect Tipperary to turn up and notch from what they did against Watford and Limerick to come with their you know their standard physicality as we see at the moment. Um, you'd be expecting fireworks at the minute. You'd obviously have to tip Limerick because they're the standard bearers, standard setters, excuse me. Um, but Tipperary, like their stock, will shoot up massively if they can come. With, do you know? I won't say come close to, to to Limerick, but at least match them in a number of areas. Because as of right now, Limerick have the answer for everybody. Bar, bar the court game, obviously. Um, but they've grown since then. They've got the players back in Gillan and Burns. <laughs> too, too good lads to get back. <laughs> they've built in a few players. And look, I think it'll be a cracker of a game, hopefully. Murph, is this an important game for Tipperary when you consider the last two or three years Limerick have had their number? This is an opportunity. I'm sure Championship is where it would really matter. But Tipperary can lay down a marker by having a right good cut at Limerick this weekend. It is. And as far as I'm concerned, this is win-win for Tipperary because they get to have a really good crack at Limerick. And let's say what we're expecting is Limerick will just have enough for them and win. Well, now Tipperary have learned an enormous amount. They're in a really good place and they can go off and prepare for a championship now. Absolutely perfect. I mean, if any team at the start of this league, if you told them that's their scenario within the league, they'll take their arm off. Okay, we're going to exit at a semi-final having a crack at Limerick. But we've learned a lot. We'll have a great structure to our setup and we'll be fairly invigorated heading into championship. I think it's brilliant. Um, and... I think where they are at the moment, they'll love the idea now of going playing this Limerick side, being underdogs going into the game. Um, because if they do get to a league final, absolutely enormous, and no one would have would have guessed that that's the way they would have finished up. Um, but they'll get to test their metal now again. You know, all these things that they're doing that's going really well. If it works really well against Limerick to a certain extent, and they win lots of areas, and they, they have purple patches in the game. Well, like that's another big green tick for for Liam Cahill and the lads just to go. Yeah, we're definitely headed in the right direction here. And to be honest, not to be you know, I'm not, not saying being pessimistic or being a bit negative. Like if they go into this game knowing that there's room to improve, that they still aren't in the right position. That you know, come round robin phase when we play Limerick, that we still have another few gears to go up, which I think is where Liam Cahill is. They'll be delighted. I don't think they're, they're, they're not where they want to be at the moment in that they still think there's a bit of room for improve. And it's the only place I think where Tipperary will be saying is if this isn't where we want to be, that they feel their hurling still can improve. Um, they won't have, the only thing with Limerick is that they won't have the, the personnel to endure 70 minutes, you know, whereas Limerick can expend that bench. And it's just, like, that's the one place now where Tipperary, I think, you know, will struggle. And, and to be honest, I think Liam Callow holds his hand up and just said, listen, that we haven't got that strength in the bench just at the moment. But they're in a great position to have a really good crack at Limerick at the weekend. Mm -hmm. And like, who's to, who's to know? Like, because it, it depends <clears throat> on what team Limerick put out. Depends what niggles they might have during the week. If they don't have, let's say, a really strong team out, there might be gaps there that, that, that Tip can exploit 
and maybe have a go at them. If they pop in a few goals as well, I think that'll be huge because teams have found it very hard, obviously, to, to penetrate this Limerick full back line. So there's lots of markers here, and we often talk each week of these markers that teams can have. I think there's loads here for Tim, for Tipperary to, to aim for, but I think either way, I, I, as long as they don't get a hammer in this weekend, which I don't see happening, I think it's 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 a win-win for Tipperary. Yeah, a lot of reversals to last year when you think about it, Skell. So this time last year, we were talking about Wexford have won five games going into the semi-final and Limerick hadn't exactly been honest. Limerick have looked very honest uh, during this league campaign, basically after their defeat against Cork on the first day. They've swept through with victory since and finished up in second place in Division uh, 1A. Do you give Tipperary a shout against Limerick this weekend? Um, I, I, Limerick, Limerick are obviously further down the line, well, way further down the line than this Tipperary team. I think we, when we looked at, you know, Westmead versus Limerick a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about a set of measurables. And I think Liam Cahill doesn't want to show everything at the moment. But if he sees a Tipperary squad that are competitive, yeah, trying to do the right things in terms of their pattern, um, don't get opened up in defence, they're physical, you know, and they work like dogs. Etc. If the skill level is not quite there, you know, the execution isn't quite there just yet, I think he'd be quite content. You know, obviously they'll try to win the game. I think it's in his, it's, it's in his nature. Um, do I give them a shot? I, I, of course I give them a shot but are they going to win I don't think so and I still do think Limerick will come out on top by 4 or 5 um, but just solely where the teams are in, in their journey if you know what I mean like if you were to move on let's say 2 months time you know with them to play each other again the things might change you know, the, the, the whole I suppose uh, landscape might be way different when you consider where, <coughs> where Tipperary could, could get to but uh, to give them a chance of course give them a chance but a fighting chance but a realistic chance of winning would I expect them to put money on them? No, I wouldn't. Okay. Respectfully speaking. That's fair enough. The other game in 1B, Leash preparing for that trip to Thurless now, they know on uh, Saturday afternoon uh, to play against Westmead. It is a weird kind of game because Dublin goes seven points up early on. They're seven points up at half time. Again, very reliant on Donald Burke. He scored 12 points, seven from freeze during the game. And then Dublin almost entirely go out of it the second half. They go 15 minutes without a score, loads of wides. Leash get the game back to four points. Again, mainly down to Picky Marr uh, converting the free opportunities that he was getting. He got 12 points as well, 11 from freeze. But then Dublin just had a bit of a kick in him in the end, got a goal and ran out 129 to 20 point winners in the end. I don't know, Murphy, where you stand on this? Leash against Westmead this weekend. Westmead got injuries. And again, it was one of those where Tommy Doyle went off at Again, Killian Doyle wasn't risked, but I believe he's going to be able to play this weekend. I don't know if Niall Mitchell is going to be available at all for them for the game. Westmead won very comprehensively when they met in the championship playoff last year. But um, I don't know. I think this is a very difficult game to call between Leach and Westmead on Saturday. I, yeah, I'd agree with you. And, and those injuries in particular. Um, but one thing in fairness you give to this Leash team is that you know, when they do smell blood and thinking back last year to the game against Antrim and Port Leash, like they, they weren't fancied in that position at all to actually go out and perform against Antrim and they did what was necessary. So if there's one thing you can say, and like a lot of these lads, when you talk about Picky Marr and these lads, you know, these are, are, are boys who went and hurled an All-Ireland quarter final against Tipperary not too long ago. Like they have been tested and they've hurled at a really high level and they're, they're great players. So I think they'll know that going against this Westmead team that you know, okay, all, all things being equal, if Westmead had all their players, it's it's a tough challenge. Um, but I think the fact that they see a few fairly formidable players there missing for Westmead, they know that if they get a sniff of it here, you know, they can really kick on. And it's something this Leash team is quite good at. I mean, you even see them against Dublin there as well. You know, Dublin drifted out of the game. You'd fancy Dublin to have, you know, a nice bit too much for Leash. But once Dublin eased off a small bit, these lads said, right, we're going to go at him, go at him. And a small thing would have maybe tipped the balance here and suddenly Dublin are on the back foot. So that's one thing I'll give this Leash team credit. It is a tough one to call, nevertheless, um, because West, this, this Westmead team is, is is a good team. And Joe Fortune is very good at setting them up, depending on what they have on any given day as well. But, you know, I kind of have to look and maybe give the benefit to here to Leash in this one. Just because of, I think, the few more experienced players that they may have on the pitch, a few more of their um, experienced lads who've been around the block and been in these positions before. Um, but it's 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 not an easy one to call and could turn out to be a right good match as well because it's, it's, it's very much in the balance. The circumstance is probably important when we consider what happened last year's scale when these teams met, where Westmead were on the back 
of some really good performances during the championship and it got that draw against Wexford while Leash's heads were understandably down they'd had a really really difficult year and it was about that game to try and save their campaign by getting a result against Westmead where I thought Westmead had a wetter sail going into that fixture <coughs> last year when they won this time round I mean Westmead were talking yesterday about how hard it's been on their squad some of the injuries they've picked up the difficulty of hurling in Division 1A for Leash it's a case of I guess just getting back up after the disappointment of that game against Antrim a couple of weeks ago yeah but I, I still you know Morph has mentioned about Leash there but I'm, I'm kind of going towards Westmead I just look at the, the with respect that the standard of opposition that Westmead have faced has been a, to a higher level than what Leash have faced um, and that stands for something I know people can stand back on the outside look at a couple of beatings a couple of trimmings that they may have received mm. particularly there during the weekend however like the way they've been competitive against really really informed counties i.e. Cork and Limerick like that that, that, that can't be discounted let's, it just can't I know they'll, they'll have a couple of injuries but I think Joe Fortune again listen to him speak at the weekend again he used to use the word bullish he is he seems like a good he comes across as a really good communicator slash motivator you know and like that all that all they're the little one percent for me and I just think Westmead are in I know they're in the same position <laughs> you know what I mean last of the group but I think they're in a better position if that makes sense you know so I'm expecting a Westmead victory by the narrowest margins I didn't expect Murphy to be bringing up structures again but I was listening to Joe Fortune's comments on the radio after the game yesterday and he was a bit crestfallen because they conceded a couple of late goals and it's almost like the the result looks worse with Galway's late scoring burst than it may have looked at 55 minutes into the game. But he was making the point at the end where he was appealing and said, I'm not saying this is Westmead manager, but as just a hurling man, this is my interest in hurling in general. He feels that they're going to have to get to a point where the teams who are trying to chase against the top nine get an opportunity to play against them more frequently. And I'm sure people are probably sick about us talking at this stage about what needs to be done for those counties. But the suggestion he was making was that try and make the championship into two wider groups, uh, maybe even merge the league and the championship a bit if they have to, because he reckons they're going to have to go with radical change or otherwise this revolving door is continuing to happen. Add Kildare probably into that mix now at this stage, but you're looking at... Antrim, Leash, Westmead, Offaly, Kerry and probably Antrim now and probably I should say Kildare now and those teams are going to be revolving into probably two or three slots every year or being at the top of the Joe McDonough and that will probably be reflected within the league itself as well. Yeah, it's interesting and it's great to hear you know the likes of him who's really at the cold face of it from this. I mean, we give our opinions each week based on what we see um, but he's obviously, you know, really involved and really invested in this as well. And I, I, I heard what he said. In fairness, he was saying it as a hurling man. It was his own words. I think it wasn't that he was Westmead manager. But no, I'd agree with him. You know, because at the moment we do see the pinch point of the league being a lot of games and teams getting ready for championship, and we're trying to find that breathing space while also, I suppose, having a high volume of games of good quality games for people to watch. Um, and when you go back to even. I don't know, was it just before, uh, I can't remember, was it before we came on air or were we on air when we were speaking? But it was just about that kind of being a bit more inclusive with the other teams and maybe by bringing a little bit more of them up, maybe instead of just bringing one up uh, where one comes up and takes hammerings, you know, there's a few more up. So they have that balance of games, which I think is what Joe Fortune was saying that, you know, okay, yeah, we'll be playing against, you know, your Galways and Tipperary's, but also, you know, there'll be a few more of us in the category there um, to actually play against each other. So we can also look forward to those games. Now, I know you'd be revolving those teams each year and that they'll be going up and down and that'll be the natural transition of it. But even seeing what the likes of there over the weekend like we have another team who are putting the hand up here saying we're not too far behind you lads we'd probably like to be involved and we'd like a few of these games and I remember as in the late 90s Kildare were you know putting it up to teams in Leinster they, were, they weren't a bad team so you know we do have a few more teams potentially coming on stream and if it the likes of Joe Fortune who like we've said it several times he's a very refreshing person to listen to and he's great opinions and as Kel was saying you know seems to be like a great communicator and great motivator if the likes of him is making a suggestion like this and hold hand like you know holding the hand up and saying it has to be kind of radical to change well I think we have to listen when someone like him as experienced as him and has been in the job as long as he has when when they say it well I think it's it's you have to listen when someone like him speaks yeah, we've already probably touched on some of the teams in Division 1A already. This was all settled uh, before the final day in this division. But Limerick again, getting game time into Aaron Galan's legs. He played the best part of an hour, as did Dermot Burns. Galan scored 1-5. Kyle Hayes came up and scored a goal from wing back. Lee Chin, again, as Scale mentioned, 
just keeps the averages ticking over 11 points 10 coming from freeze <clears throat> but probably the big point out of this one scale is the injury list for Wexford and they're one of those teams Gary Egan said afterwards that he's quite happy they have a break and that they weren't competing for a semi-final in the league mm -hmm. so looking at the injuries here Matthew O'Hanlon he described as a very significant ankle injury from the game against Cork Lee Moog McGovern's got a knee injury Connor McDonald has a calf strain from the Cork game Damien Reck has injured his hamstring Dimmer O'Keefe as we expected had a bad dead leg so that should be fine for championship but it explains why he was limping around the pitch at the end of that game yeah. Liam Ryan severed a ligament at the top of his finger against Galway on February the 4th which explains how a finger injury kept him out for so long Egan said he's definitely going to be under pressure to make the Galway game in the championship so that's a lot of walking wounded that Wexford have right now and as disappointing as they've been in the league scale it's hard to maybe make a final conclusion on them until we see this team with most of those guys actually back later in the year yeah and you when you're going through the injuries you, you'd nearly be great in them in your head in terms of <clears throat> your severity time of recovery and then you know, kind of reintegration to the team so they're playing Galway on the 23rd of April which is five weeks from now so some of the injuries do sound sound significant you'd think Liam Ryan might be back considering the, the length of time he's been off so far but like when you're talking about significant ankle injuries and knee injuries Jesus, hard to see them getting back. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, if, mm. if, if the championship was 12 weeks away, you'd say, all right, they've, they've a good chance of getting back, getting reintegrated, at, 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 uh, I suppose, a plethora of training games, etc. But here, five weeks to get up to championship pace. Jesus, that's, that's not ideal. Like, and uh, the player, and we're not just talking about, you know, respectfully speaking, fringe players or squad players. We're talking about their most prominent group, you know, yeah. the team who carried the most influence on the squad. So, or the, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's worrisome. He's very thankful for the break, I'd imagine. But they've a lot to do. I think we'll know more as, you know, in two weeks' time. If, if these guys are returned back training, then it gives a different kind of complexion on items. But if they're not back training, different story. You can't just, you can't just rock up to a championship game. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. After, well, after like, being, well, like the after players I've just named out there. So you're starting full back, probably their best marker in rec. Matthew yeah. Hanlon, who's been their co-captain for the last couple of years. They're full forward and they're out ball in Conor McDonald. Like Dimmer O'Keefe is their most important, probably runner around the middle of the field where he's going to play wing back or in midfield. Like they're significant players who aren't available at the moment. And yeah, yeah O'Keefe will be back. It's not a dead leg. O'Keefe, O'Keefe should be fine. A dead leg would be fine in a few weeks' time. But yeah. the rest of them, when you're talking again about knees and significant ankle injuries, in the case of Matthew Hannan, that is going to be probably a Wexford team who are going to be under strength for the start to Leinster at the very least uh, John Kiley was speaking about Tipperary this come weekend as well he said Tipper the form team in the league he says you're not going to be ready for championship without games so this is absolutely the best possible preparation any team knocked out this weekend is wondering where they're going to get a game next weekend whereas we know straight away our axe is going to be well sharpened so Murph any suggestion we had maybe about Limerick and maybe we thought this from the outside that ah the league doesn't really matter that much to Limerick and they'll just they know how to be right for championship now the soundings that are coming out from what John Kiley has said, he'll be more than happy to have a couple of games over the next three weeks. I think so, but part of me also thinks that he kind of has to say it because he's he's a man in a runaway train at the moment. In that it's nearly harder to make these sellers lose than to make them win. But um, I do believe, no, I do believe he wants to go and win it. Like uh, when I think back to times where we were maybe in this position where, like things, everything was just going right for you. Um, you know, Brian would have always said, no, we're here to win. And, you know, and teams would have asked, you know, are we hell-bent on winning the league? We enjoyed playing the league. We always liked every week we go out playing matches and lads want to be playing matches. And it was just this, you know, there was just a great kind of buzz around the camp. So I do genuinely believe they're happy out tipping away each week. And, you know, you could contrast it with the likes of Wexford. They don't have the injury concerns. So they can afford to keep going week on week. When you're bringing back... Gillan and Dermot Burns, I'm sure you're happy again to get another week or two into them lads. Because John John Kiley can go this week. Do you know what? Darrow Donovan, maybe he's over stretched a small bit in, in training this week. He's keep him on the bench. It's yeah, Ke 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 Keen Lynch is into it. So he has the luxury. And if you if you ask him about like Darry Egan, of course Darry Egan is delighted to be finished now because he is scratching his head going, I hope to God these lads are going to be right for championship. So no, I believe, I fully believe that what John Kiley wants is more games. Because it's you know it's it's brilliant preparation for him for championship. None of the players look fatigued, look tired, and he actually probably has a few lads coming back that he's happy to get a few games into. Um, so I fully believe that he's happy enough to go cruise through this. Most likely at the moment, you'd look at it going winning the league final and still being perfectly ready for championship. Um, so they look fresh, and I, I I don't I don't think he's just putting out lines for the media. I do genuinely believe that he's happy to be tipping away playing games. Yeah, the. Cork 
momentum goes into this game against Kilkenny Cork unbeaten in Division 1A top the table with a game to spare they've tried a lot of players out Scal I mean when the game was on against Clare now this second half was a bit weird there was only 8 scores in the entire second half and it finished 2-18 apiece in the end in Ennis but Cork had 7 players aged 22 or younger who were on the pitch during the game at the weekend they've looked at lots of players and yet they've been able to get results all the way through that to me would indicate good management and good preparation to blood the players probably in the right games along the way but that Cork panel looks a lot stronger now than they did 12 months ago it does again like, considering like you know where, where they got to last year like 12 months ago they got to the league final you know so like we're not exactly talking about them being you know coming from a place of darkness but they seem to have grown you know like like, like I said if you can and what how to put this now the whole feeling around Cork at the moment is, is one of positivity because it looks like they've got a good you know youth base They've got a squad. Their older players, but obviously Poggy is injured, are, are playing well. Do you know what I mean? They're still influential, but the young players are carrying a lot of that themselves. They're not. They're not over dependent on, on the 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 ever ever liable like the Seamus Harnadies and and these people. You know, they they have people who can do a job around, around the place. Twenty two years and younger. So fifty percent of your squad, your team, excuse me, going out against a clear team who again had a lot of the big boys out. You know the Kellys and the Conlons and whatnot, Fitzgeralds etc. And still were seriously competitive and coming able to draw at Hughie Park. That's a good result, lads. That's a really good result, you know. And they're they're a squad in form, not just a team in squad in form. They're a squad in form, and you know if they show up with their best fifteen and go at it, like I have to tip against Kilkenny just at the moment, you know, just because I, I just think they're on a good train at the moment, like. And you know, credit goes to everyone. Credit goes to the players who prepared themselves, like being being young in County Hurling nowadays. The twenty twenty one is not simple. Credit to the management for for entrusting them and preparing them to to such a degree. And look. Like I, I have nothing but good things to say about Cork. I know people might say on the podcast before that I have bad things to say about them, but that's, that's because they bloody well deserved it, you know. But see, like they, they're going at it now. They're going at it hard, and no fixture is, is too small or too large. They're treating them. They, they seem to be treating them all with a level of consistency. The whole group, uh, and they're defending hard and attacking well. So, hands up to Cork. Fair enough. I'll ask you just about Galway as well, Skell, because uh, well, I didn't see Williams. a bit of it. I didn't see a bit of well, it. Really. I only read the match reports and that was it. Uh, 427 to 112 and that was even trying to watch as much of everything as I could. So we won, yeah. You won, yeah. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Won comfortably in the end. 427 to 112. I wasn't going to ask you about the match at all. I want to ask you about David Burke's injury. The news broke with this uh, via Galway Bay early yesterday. So uh, during training last week, you know, David David Burke's been working himself back into training and it looked like he was going to be a big boost for championship. This is your All-Ireland winning captain. You know, such an important player. And then unfortunately for him, coming back off the year with St. Thomas's, he suffered a knee ligament injury. He's going to be out for all of Galway's campaign. Probably going to be a doubt for St. Thomas's later in the year too. And it's a big blow to Galway, isn't it? Oh, it's a terrible blow, let's. Like, I think if you were to just uh, take Joe Canning out of the equation for Galway over the last 10 or 12 years, David Burke is right up there second. Like, he's, he was, he's been the man, the most consistent performer, always plays well in the big games. No matter what level of preparation he's had, he's always played well. Murph mentioned about Conor Fogarty and Paddy Deegan and their fitness. Like, Burke is a machine in that midfield. He's up and down. He's such a beautiful ball player and he's a great connector between backs and forwards. Supremely intelligent. So it's an awful asset to have lost. Like, like, you know, think of his qualities on the pitch from a physical perspective, yes. But then what he does for players around him, the way he links them and talks to them as a leader, geez, it's, it's, an, it's an awful loss to have. And like, it's, it's such a loss to us that... You know, it nearly, it nearly in my mind, I'm dropping them down a, a spot in the pecking order. So, more I might have to concede to you now that Kikini might go second, right? <laughs> you know, but that's how that's that's how that's how uh, how I hold him in such high regard because I've seen over the years and even last year against Limerick how, how well he played. Maybe he, he maybe he can't do a seventy minutes, or maybe he wasn't able to do a seventy minutes, and he's working himself back into a, a fifty-five or sixty, give you everything. But like he's a huge loss, less. And I actually, while you were talking one stage of I was doing my own Galway eight to fifteen, and like there's a gaping hole there. A really is a gaping hole and I'm not sure where we're going to get a guy of his calibre to be honest and I hope as well Skell I'm not talking about you know the end of his inter-county career here but because he keeps himself in fantastic nick so I've no doubt he'll get himself back into very good shape again after this injury but at 33 I think he's 34 at the start of next year like it's a very unfortunate yeah. point in his career to be getting a ligament injury as well yeah but like he's such like so first of all you, you hit the nail on the head he keeps himself in supreme shape he lives a very very good lifestyle um, like he's very disciplined off the pitch so I, I would expect his recovery to be fast you know like abnormally fast because he keeps himself in such good pristine condition um, 
I don't think it's the interim. I hope, sorry, put it this way. I, I hope it's not the interim. I know what he's going through right now, kind of emotionally. Probably he's at the at the, the depths of it. You know what I mean? After coming back from a club defeat, trying to get back into the county, etc. And, you know, his mind could be going all, all sides. But I just hope that he just gets through his recovery, makes no statement and tries to come back again next year and finish on his own terms, which is the most important thing. Right. Prepare yourselves for the questions. I'll tell you what happened in Division 2A before we get to the questions. So Kildare directly into the final, so they can put the feet up this week on the back of their draw against Offaly. Finished up Kildare 23 points, Offaly 2 goals and 17. Offaly were three points up at half time in this game. And then Kildare took control. There was a 20 minute period in that second half where Kildare outscored Offaly by 10 points to 1. Offaly got themselves a couple of goals, David Nally and Charlie Mitchell with the goals. Looked like Offaly had just wrestled control of it going into the closing stages. And then Stephen Corcoran, their goalkeeper, was penalised while he was trying to play the ball on the ground. Kildare got themselves a free, which James Burke sent between the sticks. It was six minutes into injury time. And as an Offaly supporter, I won't complain about this because Offaly were quite lucky with the way injury time worked against Kerry. So with one hand it gives and one hand it takes away... And in this case, the referee played some additional time, which I have no real problem with because it took a while after the free was given as well for the free to be given. Kildare deserved a share of the spoils and that point is enough to see them go unbeaten into the league final, which again, I think this is a very clear indication of where Kildare Hurling is going right now and they're in pole position to qualify because they're already into the final. Off you will play against Kerry, two o'clock, Tullamore this weekend. Kerry just about got over the line against Down. They had 22 wides during the game, Kerry. They were very, very wasteful. But in the end, Shane Conway, as he often is, with nine points. Jordan Conway getting the goal after he was introduced on the bench. Kildare will be waiting for them because they've already beaten Kerry and awfully have beaten Kerry. So you would think the Kerry are probably third favourites to go up at this stage. But the most important thing for the Kingdom is that their league season is still alive and that they go to Tullamore this coming weekend. Uh, Derry were relegated. In the end, Derry lost out to Carlo, 221 to 16 points. The damage was probably done with the draw against Down the week before because Derry had inferior scoring difference going into this weekend. So they needed a big favour from Kerry if Derry were going to stay up. So it means that Derry go down now to Division 2B. So that's the standings there. Anyone's guess at this stage who's going to actually win that division uh, with a couple of games left to go. So here are the questions. Luke F212 on Instagram picked up on something that Paul Murphy tweeted about yesterday, which was sent to me by other people that weren't Paul Murphy going, uh, is this actually the case? Is Tyg de Burka wearing an earpiece on the pitch, Murph? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I saw someone saying that it was Vertigo that they explained it on TG Cahar or something. Fence, Murph. Get off the fence, come on. No, th- this is what I'm saying, that someone said it was Vertigo, but my point, if you didn't interrupt me, Scott, <laughs> was no. I've had Vertigo um, during my playing career, and when I thought I was right, if there was any hint of Vertigo there... I was absolutely bamboozled when I even stood onto a pitch again because once you once you started focusing on a ball, anybody who's had vertigo knows that fo- the more you have to focus on something, watch television, anything, it is so nauseating to try and do that. It's terrible. So if it was something to try and, I suppose, negate any vertigo he had, I've, I haven't heard of it before. And it's remarkable that he was even able to play if that was the case. But I don't think it was. It looked like an earpiece. And... It looked like at different times he was pushing it in or something. But like we've looked at earlier parts of the league where there was different microphones and lads behind goals and different things. So I think we said it before we came on. If it was any other team, Barry Davy Fitz team, we'd probably go, ah, it probably was vertigo. It probably wasn't. But it's hard to, I don't think it is. I, I think it is actually an earpiece. But um, yeah, like I was saying, I, I know when I've had vertigo, I could not hurl. I couldn't go near a pitch. I couldn't even watch a game hurl. So if there's any hint of it, and this is something to try and cure it, I don't know. Am I wrong? Is there doctors out there that'll say that is an actual cure? Are they closed with garlic or something like this? That there's some horrible remedy that I'm missing out on here? It looks like it looks like an earpiece to me. Well, Scal, if you're going to mic up anybody, it made sense with the goalkeeper because you're getting instructions maybe about restarts and puck outs and so on. But if you're going to have any outfielder on that Waterford team who'd be wearing an earpiece, DeBurka would be the one that would make sense because I would yeah. think that DeBurka is the guy who basically marshals how the defence play. And if you wanted anyone to get the messages out there, DeBurka is probably the ideal one. But I, I still, I don't know, an earpiece on an outfield player? Okay, principally, if you're using the principle of DeBurka, I think he's correct, you know, like him being the person who has the earpiece. Um, but the principle of having an earpiece in general is completely incorrect. You know, we, we, again, we, when we spoke about um, Billy Norton having the earpiece a couple of weeks ago against Leash, we said categorically, and me specifically as a goalie, says you're taking away the, the, the player's instinct, which is which is what brought him to Intercounty Hurl in the first place. You know, just his natural instinct, his natural abilities, and what he sees in front of him. Um, I don't agree with it at all. 
was it an earpiece? I think it was. Like, look, if it looks like a peak and sounds like a peak, it's generally grunt. You know, it's a peak. So, so like, when I see something like that in, in the Burka's ear, it's just, it's just too coincidental. It's just too coincidental for what we've seen, you know, in regards to the keeper beforehand. So, yes, earpiece, but they should have gone out. Okay. I still find it hard to believe that it is. But, again, I think if there's any other than a Davy Fist team, that point is well made by Murph, we probably would entirely rule it out but it is a possibility Reese Cotterill too making a point we spoke about a few months ago so he says first place in the group in the league should be given home advantage for the league semi-final yeah. um, what do you think Skell is that a good idea to incentivise coming first because then maybe you wouldn't have the dead rubber games in the last game where you'd have to make sure you finish top yeah I think it's fair I think we covered it I think first uh, like first deserve some sort of advantage like if, you, if, you've, if you've gone through the league undefeated with more points than everybody else you should get some sort of advantage which should be home, home venue. So yes, I would go along with that. Definitely. Okay, Murph. Orrin O'Connell here. Opinion on the David Fitzgerald red. Rules say red, but was it harsh? Downey not instant. Or not innocent, I should say. Um, the, the only footage I've seen of this is Buff Egan's Snapchat. So I have to base the video based on that. But I see two hits in there. I, I think this is a red card. Yeah, it's a red card by the rules. Like, I mean, we're, we're so far into these rules at this stage, we can't play ignorance and go, oh, it's not. It's soft. Like, is it? I mean, Downey didn't go down or anything. It's not a big blatant punch in the face and that he was trying to hurt him. But it was like, Downey knows what he's at by holding on to the jersey. It's like a bucking bronco. He's holding on to him, hoping, to be honest, that Davy Fitzgerald is going to react. Fitzgerald reacts. And it, it is a red card. Like, you know, I mean, we've seen like, people were crying out about Kyle Hayes the other day. Like, yeah. it, you know, you know what you're at. So it is a red card, brand of people want to say it's soft and you know, all these different things. But, you know, there's one very definite punch in the face that, okay, Downey didn't go down. But that my thing is that it doesn't, just because he doesn't go down, like, doesn't mean you don't send him off. Because the other thing is then, if players think that you have to go down when you're struck to highlight the referee, well, now we're encouraging the, the bit of diving there. So, um, no, it, it was a red card. It was a red card. Like, yeah, so, sometimes we base, you know, our opinions on the action. But I, mm. I'm based this one on the intention. You know, it's a mm. bit of schmazzle there, a bit of a pull, pull grab. Mm. But if you swipe your hand across his face twice, what do you intend to do? You intend to strike him, aren't you? Yeah. So the intention is there. But albeit the action wasn't, you know, it wasn't detrimental to Downey. You know, yeah. But like for me, it's a red card as well. And you'll have people who go on Twitter and go on social media and then try to justify, you know, Fitzgerald's actions. We've seen people in Clare before do it with regard to, who was it last year that mixed up with Hegarty? Oh, it was Aaron Rodgers, was it? No, was it? It was Aaron Fitzgerald. Aaron Fitzgerald, was it? Is that it? Is that his name? I have to have a think and check. It's Aaron anyway. His name was well, Aaron. All I can remember was the calls for Hegarty to be sent off, yeah. Yeah, um, I remember that right, yeah. Like, you know, I'll fact check what you think. He kind of sort of had to... If memory serves me correctly here now, well, did, did, did your man start to go down very soft? Am I right in saying that? Uh, that was certainly the argument, yes. Yeah. He went down very soft and then they, he actually got a yellow car for that and then something happened at the sideline and then Hegarty got a second yellow. Wasn't that it? Yeah, he pulled on the ball yeah. for a sideline or something and he, yeah. he got a... Yeah, so there was, peop, there was people, let's say, locally and clear who were fully justifying that that, that should have been a red card even as opposed to a yellow when the camera evidence kind of would, show, would say different. So in this instance, I think they have to go with it. Uh, Fitzgerald put up his hand twice across the face guard. So Carthy Jarlock. I remember us spending about half of a pod last year as well explaining why both of those yellow card incidents for Hegarty probably were a little bit harsh. So um, it's funny when you Google it, when I go to check it here, harsh comes up in four of the headlines. And Garrod Hegarty <laughs> also we explained, can't be wrong. We can't be yeah, wrong. Yeah, and Garrod Hegarty also explained at one point that he was very disappointed himself to have been sent off against Clare in an interview he did probably after the All-Ireland final. So anyway, there you go. That was Garrod Hegarty yeah. last year. Uh, look, the crux of it for me is, and this is, I think I put in the group yesterday, silly, silly, silly red card when I saw this. Snapchat story was because he's going to miss the first round of the Munster Championship and yeah. it was a meaningless game for Clare so surely if anyone's tangling out of you you just let him tangle out of you and just don't get booked or don't get sent off it's so stupid to incur a suspension at this time yeah yeah, completely and he's so important to them as well like I mean he was focal to them getting to a Munster final and performing so well last year so yeah without him it's ah, it's a pity no it's a big pity for Clare yeah he might appeal it but again purely based on that video I think it's very hard to argue how there's any mitigating circumstances to, to actually not get suspended but anyway um, there are the joys of the CCCC and the DRA if he goes that direction uh, Barry C88 asking Murph can you see Kildare competing in the Leinster Championship in the next three to five years um, competing is probably an interesting word taking part mm. is probably different to competing taking part in the next five years I, I think is very possible 
Yeah, absolutely. And just going by NACE, how strong they're performing, um, uh, using that as an indicator. You know, like they're, they're they're a dual county essentially now. Like they're performing at a really high standard. And what they're doing, like they're a really good team to watch. Um, and winning all their games. Oh, well, no, sorry, last one, Drew, the last one. But like, it's it's a great it's a great indicator for Kildare. I'd agree exactly with you. You know, if you're to really split hairs and say competing, you know, participating, whatever it's going to be, it'll take time, obviously. But certainly, look, they're part of the conversation now, and you can definitely see like they have a lot of young players coming through. And there's in 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 Kildare, Harlan is gaining a lot of traction as well so with that you need that conveyor belt coming through and you need them for something to aim to I do think it's very realistic in the next few years that we'll see Kildare back in the main stage Mm. the difficulty scale if Kildare are going to get to that stage they're going to have to beat teams who are slightly ahead of them so while they would very much fancy Offaly or Kerry right now given the way they've gone in Division 2A they may well have to beat Leash or Westmead or Antrim, depending on who's in the Joe McDonough to get up. Mm-hmm. Joe McDonough is a very hard division to get out of, even if I think Kildare have the talent to do so over the next five years. Yeah, it's like it's like the intermediate division in Club Hurland, so hard to get out of it because it's so hot, hotly contested. Um, and it was probably one of the issues that faced the Division 2 teams overall, if you move up in Division 1, is is squad depth, squad strength, quality player, etc. You know, they, they all, all have to be nurtured over time. And I think five years is fair. I think if they wanted to participate in the championship, they probably could in the next couple of years. But for them, they, you want to sustain it. You don't, you don't want this yo-yo effect where you're just going up and down because you're not you're not really gaining traction with the youth or you know developing the group as a whole. So I think five years, yeah, for sure. But they should continue in the steps they're going at the moment in focusing on schools, focusing on youth across the board and uh, try to get more players integrated, quality players integrated into the Kildare team to be competitive you know, in five to ten years as opposed to just participating or partaking in three to five. I'll give you both this question. So, Murph, you can answer it first. Bo Lawler, who has gotten the most and subsequently the least from the league so far this year? I would say the most, Kilkenny and Tip, and the least, probably Wexford. Yep, I'd say that's fair enough to say. Uh, I think Tipperary got the most, really. Um, they're really in a good place uh, going in. Not to say Kilkenny aren't, but um, no, Tipperary are tipping over really well there, no pun intended at the moment. But Wexford... Yeah, look, Wexford have just shipped a lot of injuries and, and shipped a few beatings as well. So I think is exactly on point. Like a lot of other teams took a few bits here and there and um, will generally enough will we'll make do with what they're after taking from the league. But certainly when you look back to even us here in episode one, assessing Tipperary to where they are now, you know, they'll be absolutely delighted. And they're looking like a really exciting prospect. I hate saying that as a Kilkenny man going into a, a championship, but they are. Um, and yeah, exactly, Wexford. I mean, Wexford are happy to be done and dusted with the league now. Um, they're reconsolidating now at the moment and they're trying to get lads back. So he's 100% Bo's, Bo's right there. Bo knows. That's what they, is that Bo Jackson's old thing? Bo knows. Bo Jackson, great player in his day. Bo Jackson. So Bo knows, he's right. Wexford got the least and Tip got the most, I'd say. I'm surprised with your American sports knowledge there now, Bo. It's a great Jackson. ESPN 30 for 30. Yeah. Bo knows, Bo Jackson. It's Duke absolutely Blair. brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you agree or disagree, Scal? Um, I suppose the way I look at it is slightly different. I would look at, Lee, at teams who had new managers this year. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm just counting kind of Limerick. And, <laughs> exactly, Limerick, yeah. you know, Galway, etc. So I think the team who got most of the league is shared between Tip and Cork. You know, I think Cork have been, have been, have been excellent. They, they turned over Limerick, albeit the first game of the year, so there has to be an allowance for that. But Tip have been seriously impressive. And the team who's given the you know who'll be looking for searching for answers, I think, is Waterford. You know, Wexford will probably pinpoint the injuries and say that they've lost so much of their core group. That's that's the reason that they haven't performed as well, which isn't a bad reason at all. But I'd say Waterford, with the lads they have their, at their disposal, they'd be very very disappointed with the way things turned out in the end. Yeah, not to be glib about Sham Rover Massey's comment, but we can maybe talk about Dublin in more detail in another Some podcast name. on a quiet day. It's a great name. Why can't Dublin get 15 lads who can swing a stick better than the rest, given the population? <laughs> That's a broad question. <laughs> so it's a very broad question. He's it's obviously a, a Shamrock Rover supporter there. Uh, yeah, it says Massey, though. There's no Massey Ferguson there. No, no. <laughs> uh, very, very good question. Very good avatar from uh, Sham Rover Massey as well. We can definitely come back to that another day, I think. And the last one that came in, which was ironically enough, the first question that came in when I put the story up yesterday uh, came in from my Faye who said worried about Claire question mark last complete performance was in June 2022 you could say what do you think Murph Claire haven't performed since uh, I'm going to say the All-Ireland quarterfinal if we're going to say June 2022 yeah um, like 
as a neutral, I'm not worried about them. Like they're playing quite flat. As a Clare supporter, I'd be kind of saying, I mean, Clare supporters, I think at the moment are going, we want what we got last year. That's, at the moment, it's looking like that's not going to happen. But Clare were pretty much in this position last year as well when they entered into the championship and suddenly came out of nowhere, really. Um, I think if Tony Kelly gets fired, and again, two games with Tony Kelly not scoring, you're kind of going, again, not concerned, but it's certainly whatever the teams have managed to do there, you know, teams will be looking at that to maybe keep Tony Tony Kelly quiet. But I wouldn't, it's not cause for concern yet, but I think maybe Clare fans are pinning their expectations on going to a Munster final again and maybe going and turning over Limerick this time, which at the moment I would say is a, is a bit of a reach. And the fact that they exited the championship last year, the way they did against Kilkenny shows that it took so much out of a small group of players really in terms of you're relying on so many players. You're relying on those players again to go to the well and to perform like that. I, I, I do think they're capable of getting on a run and really going because once championship comes around I think teams will get a new edge to their play and I think Clare could very well be like they're not coming out of this league with their heads in the dumps going geez we're terrible they're not they just kind of tipped along through it and didn't learn a whole lot and um, bad performance against Limerick but they're not in a bad place it's just a lot will will rely on getting up and going fairly early in this round robin um, and if they build momentum there right, brilliant yeah I think they're capable of turning up and, and and maybe possibly even getting to a Munster final. Just at the moment, I don't see it. But um, look, yeah, if you're, if, you, if you're a clear supporter and you're hoping for a replication of last year or maybe even a step further, I don't see that at the moment. Okay, I'm mindful of the two lads of training. So one last question for Skell before we go. This came in from Sinead Kyo. My question is too long for the question box, but can you ask Skell, what is the best way to bet in a new goalkeeper in his view? I feel like second choice goalkeepers aren't given the chance to get valuable experience under their belt while the first choice is still doing well. Ideally, you would rotate, but it's a huge responsibility and understandable that the manager doesn't want to take risks with that position. I always feel, though, that new keepers are a bit green when they come in and finally get the number one jersey. What are Skell's thoughts about getting a number two goalkeeper ready to take over as number one? Um, I think if you look at somewhere like Waterford, we've got Billy Nolan and Sean O'Brien, they're kind of, kind of equally matched. You know, having them every second game is a tricky one. It really is a tricky one because they're they're evenly matched and, you know, in order to, you want to build up your number one goal, goalkeeper first of all to a standard and then have your two try to catch them. The two boys, when they're kind of going tit for tat and changing every second game, neither of them get up to a, a really kind of top level standard. So that's one instance. If you've got in a situation where like if Kinney where Owen Murphy is is out, standing out by himself, you know what I mean. You can be afforded to give your second choice goalie two or three games in a row because you know what Owen Murphy's going to give you. You know what he's going to bring. If you've got a young goalkeeper who's next to nineteen twenty, you just have to keep him there for a year or two just to get around the place. Maybe play the odd Walsh Cup game or league game, nothing major. But he's just going to have to bide his time and integrate himself into the overall inter county setup as opposed to a game. But the only way a goalkeeper gets really really good and accustomed to his conditions is repetition that's games so it's just it's it's one of these positions will you just can't like you know it's just you just can't if you can go up and down between the development squad and getting them playing repetitive games or putting them back to his club to keep them sharp that's one thing but when you're getting to inter-county championship it's extremely difficult to have your number two as sharp as your number one from a match perspective because ultimately you're there to win the games put your best 15 on the pitch and that's your number one goalie so it's difficult circumstance as well, Scott, because we had Barry Hennessy on off the ball when he retired and he was talking about the fact that in a way he looks at it and goes, you know what, there's a very clear number one right now. I just have to try and be the best number two that I can be as much as I want to play, but maybe it means Nicky has to get an injury if I'm going to come in. That yeah. He was about keeping Nicky Quaid sharp as opposed to trying to fight for the place. I think compared to other positions, goalkeeper is one where it's very, very difficult to actually be in that backup position. It's, it's difficult and especially it's, it's where you view yourself and the manager view yourself um, and like for me on the outside looking in there was a degree of separation between Barry and Nicky so I think Barry would have looked at that and said right my job has shifted here a bit I've got to push this man as much as he can and iron sharp, sharpens iron so the better I go the better he goes the harder I go the harder he might go etc because if Barry just threw the how would I say threw in the towel put the ties out of the pram that's no good to anybody it's no good to anybody you're only as good as the people who come behind you there you go. Advice from James Gell, who had to fight off plenty of competition during his Galway career yeah, as well. A perfect man. <laughs> <laughs> Lads, it's been a pleasure here on episode seven. At least next week, we'll be able to watch the vast, vast majority of the hurling and it's going to get lots of prominence, I think, on League Sunday as well. So we can look forward to that this coming weekend. We'll talk to you again next Monday, lads. Sound lads. Thanks, folks.